Welcome everyone to episode 17, Remastered. So far in this little series on genetics, I've covered the structure and the basic physiology of DNA. I've covered translation and transcription, meiosis, and a little bit about the ways that the cell builds and repairs DNA. This episode will scale things up a little bit. I'm going to be referencing some of the material that I covered in the previous episodes, like transcription regulators and ribosomes and stuff, but I'm going to be framing it in a larger context. Where I was focusing on DNA at the level of the nucleotide base and the enzyme, today I'll be zooming out a little bit to the level of genes and chromosomes. Specifically, I'm going to discuss how genes are expressed and how the cell regulates that expression. So let's start with the basics. Every cell in your body, with the exception of gametes, contains the two copies of 23 different chromosomes. Each copy of a chromosome has a unique blend of traits inherited from your parents. These traits, stuff like green eyes or black hair, are coded for by alleles. An allele is like a version of a gene. Everyone has a gene for a particular trait, like hair color, but we each only have one or two of a few specific alleles for a particular hair color, for a particular trait. Similarly, everyone has a gene for eye color. We all have an eye color trait, but we all also have different alleles for our particular eye color. Alleles exist in every species for almost every trait you can think of. Mammals have alleles for their fur color, or alleles for functional traits in the fur, like water resistance or better heat retention. Reptiles have alleles for patterns on their scales, for coloration that would help absorb or reflect light. Insects have alleles for the shape of their wings, and for the color of their bodies and the positioning of their limbs and joints. Mendel studied pea plants, with alleles for color and shape of their seeds, among other traits, other traits that many other plants have, like alleles for stuff like the shape and size of their leaves, the shape and size and color of their flowers, and the composition of their bark. On a chemical level, the gene is a sequence of bases within the DNA. In the case of protein coding genes, the genetic code is read three bases at a time and matched to corresponding amino acids. The amino acids are then linked together in a chain, according to the coding sequence in the gene. This amino acid chain, this polypeptide, will then fold up on itself to make a functional protein. Through this general process, a gene is transcribed and translated into a protein, which then does all manner of stuff, depending on what type of protein it is, throughout the cell. When you think of all the actions taken by all the proteins and all the enzymes in a cell, the inside of the cell can seem like a crazy and chaotic place, but there is an order to this chaos, a method to the madness, so to speak. This is because if a cell expressed all of its genes all the time, it would destroy itself. The cell would have to gorge on nutrients to sustain the protein synthesis, and the subsequent protein activity would be totally out of control and misregulated. It would be out of balance, and the result would be catastrophic. To administer a little order to this chemical wilderness, the cell engages in selective expression of particular genes. Have you ever wondered how all your cells can have the exact same genome, your genome, and yet each cell can be wildly different? I mean, your skin cells are flat and heavily layered, but the cells lining your intestines are shaped like columns, and they're loosely packed so as to maximize their surface area. The muscle cells in your legs are like long, powerful cords, but the cells in your eyes are small and delicate and sensitive to light. The cells in your bones are isolated from one another in a matrix of calcium salts, but the cells in your brain are all closely intertwined and interconnected. And despite all of these differences in morphological form and physiological function, skin cells and intestinal cells, muscle cells and retinal cells, bone cells and neurons all have the same total set of genes, the same genome. The obvious question, then, is... How are all of these cells so different when they all have the same genes? The answer, as you might have guessed from the title of this episode, is differential gene expression. This means that each cell in your body 
only accesses and expresses a small and very specific portion of the genes in your total genome. Neurons express a far different set of genes than bone cells, just as retinal cells express different groups of genes than a muscle cell. And in each case, the cell has access to this set of genes, and it expresses these genes in its own carefully regulated way. So if gene expression has to be balanced in order to synthesize a healthy, living, functional organism, or tissue, or organ, or whatever, well, think of it like an orchestra. If every instrument played all at once, with an impressive but uncoordinated passion, all you would hear is noise. It would be calamity. But if every instrument plays in coordination with one another, with some instruments coming in only for a moment, while others play for a longer period of time, some instruments might play the entire piece, and others might only have a single note. But however it works, the result is a beautiful symphony. In much the same way, the cell must express its genes like a conductor leads an orchestra. The gene expression has to be handled with finesse and care, so that the cell can maintain the delicate chemical balance of life. Some genes are expressed rarely, or only in very specific circumstances, while other genes are expressed frequently, almost all the time. Constitutive genes are those that are more or less constantly expressed, as they relate to some kind of base function like cellular respiration. Furthermore, a cell is under intense pressure to express its genes effectively and efficiently. Expressing a gene when you don't need to just wastes the chemical resources. I mean, well, since the cell recycles everything, it's not really wasting, it's more like putting some of its resources in pointless projects that just get them tied up and unable to be used for something else that might be more important. The cell would have fewer resources immediately at hand with which to build the proteins that it actually needs. This can be mortally dangerous for a single-celled organism, or for individual cells within a larger eukaryotic organism. In eukaryotes, if faulty gene expression is shared across a, a large number of cells, it can often be fatal to the organism itself. So now we get to the meat and potatoes of the episode. How does the cell regulate its expression of these various genes? How does it go about mastering this chemical orchestra so as to play a symphony by growing properly and staying alive? Recall the mechanisms of gene expression that lead from gene to protein. The gene contains the encoded information, which is read during transcription. It's then translated into a protein, and the protein is modified in some way so as to activate it. The cell can stick its foot in the door at any of these steps in the process, shutting the whole thing down or redirecting the resources, and thus controlling the expression of the gene. Transcriptional control prevents DNA from being read in the first place. And if it is read, it prevents a molecule of mRNA from being created. In this way, transcriptional control is the most efficient, as it prevents any resources from being tied up in an mRNA molecule, or worse, a protein molecule. A downside of transcriptional control is that it's relatively slow, responding lazily to changes in the cell's environment. The next step is translational control, and this happens after an mRNA molecule has been formed but it just prevents the mRNA from being translated into a protein, usually by interfering with or shutting down the ribosome. Because the mRNA is already present at this step, the cell can choose to translate it or not, depending on various factors. Now, post-translational control is pretty simple, as it just involves the activation or minor modification of an otherwise finished protein. This regulatory step can be very quick, but it requires tapping the cell's supplies of energy molecules, like ATP, which makes this kind of quick response regulation energetically expensive. I'm going to dive into more detail on the regulation of genes and gene expression at each of these steps. Okay, so there are two basic methods for regulating gene expression at the first step, at transcription. Transcriptional control can be either positive or negative. It's pretty intuitive. Positive control involves the activation of stuff, while negative control involves the deactivation of stuff, or shutting stuff down, or stopping something. 
To be a little more specific, positive control uses proteins called activators to bind to specific points on the DNA and initiate transcription. In episode 15 about transcription and translation, I briefly discuss how the RNA polymerase molecule has to bind to promoter proteins at an initiator region. These promoter proteins are like activators. They bind to a point on the DNA, like an initiator region, and then they attract enzymes, like RNA polymerase, to come and build a primer. The DNA polymerase will then come and build off of the primer, and this will initiate transcription. These promoter proteins that first invite the RNA polymerase to build the primer, these are activators. Now on the other hand, we have negative control, which uses proteins called repressors. The repressor protein will also bind to the DNA, but instead of enabling transcription, it'll interfere with the enzymatic machinery involved in transcription and basically shut the whole process down. An important part of this process that we can't overlook is the DNA sequence that the activators and the repressors bind to. These regions are called promoters, or operators, or initiators, and they're important for the regulation of gene expression. When a gene or a set of genes needs to be expressed, a specific activator is synthesized. This specific activator will bind to the promoter region and attract a molecule of RNA polymerase. Sets of different genes can all share the same initiator sequence. So when a protein is synthesized that can activate that particular sequence, it will then activate the expression of every gene sequence in the set. These expressed genes will then go on to produce proteins and these will perform whatever function the cell needs. The genes that get expressed in groups or in sets like this typically code for proteins that interact or work together in some capacity. Let's say that there's some biochemical process that requires an enzyme complex, just a, a big heaping mass of dozens of different proteins, all interlocking together and cooperating to perform some kind of greater meta-reaction. It would be very inefficient for the cell to individually activate all of the genes needed for this enzyme complex. If two dozen genes all have different initiator regions, the cell will need to create two dozen different kinds of activators or repressors to regulate their expression. Instead, each gene involved in coding the proteins of the enzyme complex all have the same initiator sequence. This sequence lies at the start of the gene, so a bound activator protein will attract an RNA polymerase and position it right where it needs to be to build a primer so as to attract DNA polymerase and begin transcription. This way, the cell only needs to produce a single type of activator protein to express these multiple genes. So if you have a whole bunch of these activator proteins floating around the DNA like a mist, these will only bind with their specific initiator sequences, and as a result, only those specific genes will get expressed. The proteins involved in this giant complex are thus all produced at once, all from a single triggering enzyme, and after they're all synthesized at the same time, they all assemble together to rapidly form the functional enzyme complex. This process allows groups of genes, or individual genes, to be selectively expressed in a very deliberate and very careful manner. The cell expresses only the genes that code for the proteins it needs at that particular moment for whatever purpose. This finely tuned regulation at the start of transcription really maximizes the efficient use of resources in the cell by nipping in the bud any transcription process that would have been stopped further down the chemical pathway for whatever reason. The positive and negative control mechanisms that I've just described exist in both single celled bacteria and in multicellular eukaryotes. Eukaryotes share a transcriptional regulatory mechanism because of the way that they store their DNA. In bacteria, DNA is kept in the form of a giant loop. The loop is exposed and can be accessed by regulatory proteins at any time. But eukaryotes store their DNA in a tightly wound superstructure called chromatin. This superstructure involves a large number of proteins that organize and sort the DNA strand as it's wound up into a very large supercoil. For example, the DNA strand makes two loops around a large globular mass called the nucleosome. 
The nucleosome is a protein complex, which is then tightened into a growing pile of other nucleosomes, which all get tightly wound up with DNA, and these all get wound up into a rope that's about 30 nanometers thick. Other proteins then stabilize this supercoiling, and they reinforce the bonds holding everything together. This 30 nanometer wide rope of DNA and proteins will then get looped around a long scaffold protein, which itself is folded down to form chromosomes. So the chromosomes are huge DNA protein superstructures. The chromosome's limbs are coiled appendages of scaffold proteins, surrounded by the 30 nanometer fiber that's making fluffy loops. That fiber is itself a supercoiled DNA strand, tightly packed together with stabilizing proteins. In the more densely packed regions of chromatin, regulatory molecules like activators, repressors, and RNA polymerase can't access any promoter regions to begin transcription. DNA expression is totally shut off for genes that happen to be wound up in this densely packed region of the supercoil. So what if the cell wants to express a gene that's currently wound up somewhere in the chromatin? The answer seems obvious. A region of the chromatin is loosened, and regulatory proteins can then access this loosened DNA. But what are the mechanisms behind this process? Well, one mechanism is called DNA methylation, and another mechanism is called histone modification. So let me start with DNA methylation. At various points in the DNA, typically in sequences around a promoter, there are cytosine residues, or CG sequences. The CG sequence is mirrored with a GC sequence on the other strand. Now both of these cytosine bases on either strand are methylated, which is to say that they have a methyl group attached to them. The methyl group is just a single carbon molecule bound to three other hydrogen atoms. These methyl cytosine groups are called CPG sequences, and they're signals that tell the DNA to condense into chromatin. Regions of DNA that have a higher concentration of CPG sequences will thus be packed tighter into chromatin. Because they're packed tightly, it's hard for these activators and RNA polymerase molecules to get access to them to express them, so these genes aren't expressed. These methyl groups, however, can be removed, which effectively removes the signal for DNA to condense in that particular region. Regions of the chromatin that have been loosened up allow for the, the activators and the repressors and the RNA polymerase and everything else to come in and perform transcription. Regions of the chromatin that have been loosened up to allow for transcription will thus have low concentrations of CPG sequences. The other mechanism for chromatin remodeling is called histone modification, and this involves the addition or removal of various chemical groups to the histone proteins that compose the nucleosome. When I discussed proteins in episode 3, I covered the R groups, or the side chains on each amino acid in the polypeptide chain. The R groups can be acidic or basic, they can be positive or negatively charged, or they can be polar or nonpolar. And these qualities determine how the polypeptide chain will fold, and they ultimately determine its functional capacity as a finished protein, or an enzyme. The chemical groups that get added to the histones work in much the same way. They're polar or nonpolar, they're acidic or basic, or they have some other quality that makes them interact in particular ways with the DNA and with the histone, as well as other histones and other molecules. For example, a basic chemical tag called an acetyl group with the chemical structure COCH3 can be added or removed from the histone. When the histone is acetylated, its positive charge is reduced. Specifically, an amino acid within the histone structure called lysine has its positive charge neutralized by the acetyl group. Remember that positives and negatives attract. DNA is negatively charged because of all the phosphate groups in its backbone, while the histones are relatively positively charged molecules, due in part to amino acids like lysine that exist within its structure. Now when the histone is acetylated, its positive charge gets reduced, and it shares a weaker attraction with the DNA. Not only does this cause the chromatin to loosen up, it also causes the DNA strands to loosen up from the nucleosome itself. This region of DNA is then exposed to the regulatory molecules in the cell, 
which can then access and begin expressing various genes. Have you ever heard the term epigenetics? It refers to this pattern of DNA methylation, or histone modification, which is heritable and can be passed down from parent cell to daughter cell. Recall how earlier I was describing how various types of cells are all different because they selectively express a particular handful of genes, even though they all contain uh, the same total genome. When a specialized cell replicates, its daughter cells will inherit the same pattern of epigenetic regulation that ensures that they will have the same specialization as their parent cell. This is to say that a skin cell will only divide to produce more skin cells, and a liver cell will only divide to produce more liver cells, and so on. The patterns of epigenetic regulation are preserved, and they thus create a lineage of cells that share the same specialization. In stem cells, which don't have this particular epigenetic pattern, uh, stem cells will eventually specialize into a particular lineage, like skin cells or liver cells, depending on the methylation signals, the methylation patterns that are established. And so if they're surrounded by cells of a particular type, they'll mirror those epigenetic signals and become one of those cells. Now, in addition to epigenetic modifications, the eukaryotic cell also uses DNA sequences to assist in regulation. Some of these DNA sequences are near the promoter region, and these are called promoter proximal elements. These sequences will bind to specific proteins, which then attract or interfere with the enzymes that are involved in transcription. This increases the specificity with which the cell can express its genes. Both bacteria and eukaryotes have promoter proximal elements, but only eukaryotes have sequences called enhancers. Now, unlike promoter proximal elements, the enhancers are sequences of DNA that are positioned far away from the promoter, sometimes more than 100,000 base pairs away, upstream or downstream, on either strand. These enhancers are like random start points for transcription. A suite of proteins called transcriptional activators will cluster around the enhancer sequence, and they'll initiate transcription from there. Eukaryotes also have regulatory sequences called silencers that do the opposite. Repressor proteins will bind to the silencer and act as a physical block that impairs transcription. Okay, so now that I've laid down some of that biochemical framework, let's reflect for a minute. Cells use positive and negative control to regulate gene expression before transcription. These control mechanisms rely on proteins called activators and repressors, which can stimulate or suppress expression of a gene, respectively. All kinds of different cells express different genes. These genes are organized into groups with different promoter regions, different operators and initiators. It takes an equally varied group of activator and repressor proteins to bind to all of these different sequences and thus express genes that sustain life. So not only does one type of cell have a library of activator and repressor proteins, these are just one of many different libraries used by different types of cells. The point here is that there are a tremendous number of proteins involved in the regulation of gene expression at just the transcription level. These proteins are called regulatory transcription factors. Muscle cells have one suite of transcription factors, while neural cells, or retinal cells, each have a much different suite of transcription factors, each suited to bind to the promoters or the regulatory sequences of the genes that those particular cells need to express for their particular specialization. Transcription is suppressed when transcription factors bind to silencer sequences, or when the DNA condenses into chromatin and basically blocks out all of the transcription factors. Oh man, okay, well, if you thought that that wasn't complicated enough, just wait, because there's more. Where regulatory transcription factors are needed for the expression of specific genes, a more general class of proteins are required for all transcription events. These more general proteins are called basal transcription factors. They don't bind selectively to particular genes, they instead bind to all promoter regions, and they stabilize to form a large macromolecular complex around the DNA. 
This also includes a suite of proteins that are collectively called mediator. This mediator complex has its name because it joins everything together and has it all work together in synchrony. The mediator complex connects the regulatory transcription factors, the basal transcription factors, and the mRNA polymerase that are all needed to actually synthesize the mRNA. It combines them all together and gets them all working in this organized mass. Every time a cell wants to express a gene, it has to get all of these proteins and all of these enzymes organized together into this huge, interlocking, interacting, complex mass of chemical machinery. It takes this whole thing to start eukaryotic transcription. Once transcription is complete, the cell has produced a molecule of mRNA. The next big step in gene regulation takes place here, after transcription and after the mRNA molecule has been, has been synthesized, but before translation. This pre-translational control can take many forms, but the form you're probably most familiar with is gene splicing. Recall from episode 15 that RNA produced by RNA polymerase has alternating sections called introns and exons. The introns are interrupting sequences, and so they get cut out and uh, removed. While the exons are retained, and they're pieced together into a functional strand of mRNA. So after the cell has cut up the RNA into its constituent introns and exons, it can choose to exclude an exon or two. By omitting an exon here or an exon there, a single gene can code for a single RNA molecule, which can then be spliced into a number of different mRNA molecules, which in turn lead to the production of an equal number of different proteins. This is called alternative splicing, because the cell is using splicing to create alternative versions of the original mRNA sequence. It's believed that up to 90% of our genes produce RNA that can undergo alternative splicing to create alternative mRNAs, which means that up to 90% of our protein-coding genes are able to code for multiple different proteins. Also recall that a produced mRNA molecule undergoes a brief period of modification. The mRNA is given a tail of repeating adenosine monomers and a molecular hat on its 5' end. The polyadenosine tail is like a telomere. It protects the end of the mRNA from degradation. The shorter the tail, the less degradation the mRNA molecule can withstand before the genetic material itself starts getting damaged. A longer polyadenosine tail can endure degradation for longer periods of time. Basically, this means that the initial length of a polyadenosine tail can be used kind of like a timer, or uh, if you will, a bomb fuse. The mRNA is functional only for as long as its polyadenosine tail can protect it. So mRNA that needs to be cleaned up quickly or destroyed after a short time interval, it'll have a short tail. Conversely, mRNA that needs to stick around for a while and be used for repeated rounds of translation, these are given a longer tail. Translation can also be prevented through a mechanism called RNA interference. Basically, a hairpin loop is formed between some complementary sequences in the product RNA. This hairpin loop gets chewed up by enzymes to produce a short little RNA molecule about 22 bases long. This short sequence is absorbed into a larger molecule complex called RISC, or RISC, which stands for the RNA-induced silencing complex. This RISC complex then binds with the molecule of mRNA. If the binding is a perfect fit, the mRNA is targeted for destruction. If the binding is slightly imperfect, then it isn't destroyed, but it still can't be used for translation. Translational controls typically involve some kind of interference in the mechanisms of translation. For example, a ribosome can be phosphorylated. This will cause the ribosome to distort, undergoing a conformational change that reduces or eliminates entirely its functionality. Post-translational controls involve manipulating the protein in some way to activate it or inactivate it. Understand that translation is the process by which a molecule of mRNA becomes a protein. So after translation, in the post-translational stage, the cell has to deal with a protein, with a polypeptide chain, not a nice little nucleic acid. 
If you listen to episode 3 about proteins, and episode 9 about enzymes and energy, you should understand that proteins can be in an active or an inactive state. In the active state, their conformation is suitable to perform a given task. And in the inactive state, the protein has been denatured, or it's in some kind of conformational state that renders it useless and unable to react with its target substrate molecules. These proteins can be activated or inactivated like a light switch. Just like you can turn the light switch on and off, the protein can undergo a small modification to transition between active and inactive states. The most common form of post-translational protein modification is through phosphorylation. A phosphate group carries with it an extremely negative charge. When the phosphate group is added or removed from a protein, the introduction or removal of such an electronegative particle will induce a major conformational change in the protein. This change is like the trigger that moves the protein into or out of its activated state. Instead of being phosphorylated, a protein can also be given other kinds of molecular modifications, like a small carbohydrate or polysaccharide tag that acts as a chemical signal for other molecules. Sometimes a portion of the final protein has to be broken off, and only after this portion is removed can the protein become activated. In other cases, the protein doesn't need anything added or removed to it, but it still needs help folding properly. These kinds of proteins might naturally fold into their inactivated state after being synthesized, and they require other enzymes, called chaperone proteins, to manipulate their conformation into the active state. Furthermore, a protein can be destroyed if it is no longer needed, and its parts get reused to make new proteins. In cases like this, some kind of chemical tag is put onto the protein. One such chemical tag is called ubiquitin, which is, quite literally, ubiquitous in the cell. Ubiquitin tags are placed all over a protein marked for destruction, and a complex called a proteasome recognizes these ubiquitin tags and proceeds to destroy the protein. There's a very Robocop-esque feel to it, although this is nothing compared to the immune system, where there are cell types that are specialized for hunting down and destroying infected cells, kind of like an assassin or a bounty hunter. But that's a whole different topic that I'll be covering in a later series. As for gene expression, that's about all that I have for this episode. I think I covered my bases pretty well, but just in case you feel a little spotty, let me briefly recap everything I discussed. So cells have positive and negative control mechanisms. Positive control is the active expression of a gene, while negative control is the active suppression of that gene. Bacteria keep their DNA more or less permanently loose and always available for transcription. Eukaryotes keep their DNA in dense masses of chromatin as a negative control, and they loosen up specific regions of the chromatin as a positive control. Regulatory sequences in or near the genes can bind to all sorts of regulatory molecules that can assist or suppress transcription. These regulatory sequences are also used to organize and coordinate the expression of multiple genes at once. It should be noted that eukaryotic transcriptional control is orders of magnitude more complicated than transcriptional control in bacteria. Once transcription has produced an mRNA molecule, the mRNA can be spliced into a variety of ways to produce multiple different proteins. Other molecules of RNA can bind to the mRNA and destroy it, or prevent its translation. Once the mRNA has been translated into a protein, the protein can be activated or inactivated through a variety of mechanisms, including phosphorylation, reconfiguration, and targeted destruction. The purpose of this multi-layered, tightly regulated gene expression is to coordinate the extremely complex chemical dance, the chemical orchestra, that's required to grow and maintain a living organism. The improper or failed regulation of gene expression can cause serious problems. When gene expression goes haywire during fetal development, the downstream effects can be so disastrous that they can be lethal. In order to develop properly and keep itself alive, a healthy organism must have exquisitely controlled gene expression. Just like the conductor leading an orchestra to play a grand symphony, the cell must precisely regulate its expression of genes in order to grow and survive. Alright, I think that wraps it up. 
I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I hope you learned something cool about the way that the cell controls the expression of its genes. Gene expression is a very important aspect of biology that seems to have an influence in virtually everything, so it's good that you now have a solid groundwork of information to work with. Again, I hope you enjoyed the episode, and as always, thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.